Hi, good morning, good afternoon. You know, my name is Paul Roberts. I'm a solutions architect here at Amazon Web Services. Today, I'll be presenting along with my friend, Urshad, and we're gonna be talking about continuous software delivery using Spinnaker and Jenkins in the cloud. Urshad and I are both architects here and are really excited to talk to you um, at the Spinnaker Summit today. So the first thing is, is that I'd like to run through the overall agenda. And we've, we thought it would be a lot of fun to create a, a scenario here. Um, and this is the a pet clinic scenario or theme. And, you know, for context, I recently adopted, you know, a new, uh, a, a new dog. She's a white German shepherd. And so we wanted to get her integrated into this. We think it's going to be a lot of fun. So the first topic is going to be talking about application modernization challenges using this pet clinic scenario. Next, you know, we're going to get into a little bit of an Amazon EKS overview. Um, and just to give you, you know, some insight into, you know, how folks are, you know, deploying, uh, their workloads for Spinnaker inside of, of uh, Kubernetes. Next, we're going to provide you an overview on continuous software delivery. And then uh, we're going to walk through infrastructure as code using the Terraform cloud. And finally, the reason why you all are here is we're going to walk through you know, an awesome demo that Urshad has put together. So, you know, the first thing is, is as, as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we built this this uh, this demo for you all, and we we are going to you know um, frame it as as a new you know pet clinic, and you know so as as a as a uh, a pet clinic or a veterinarian, um, you know our website has been a little outdated, and we we need to go through a modernization effort, and through this. You know, the typical way of, you know, building, you know, a new website and deploying new artifacts has taken us, you know, many weeks or months to actually get this done. So what we want to do is we want to figure out, is there a way that we can use newer technologies such as Spinnaker to help us with this modernization effort? And so through this, we're going to be modernizing our pet clinic, you know, live. So today, you know, our, our, our website here, you can see that, you know, we have this, this young puppy and, you know, this, this kitten here. Um, which is totally fine, but as I mentioned earlier, is that you know I recently adopted you know a new uh, a new pet, and we want to make sure that you know this new pet is showing up on the website appropriately. And traditionally, if we were going to go go through this effort, you know we'd have to go edit a file. We might actually have to you know FTP over some new assets. And the challenge is, if you're doing that, it could be very cumbersome. It's prone to making mistakes. And really, this should be going through, you know, a full CI and CD cont continuous integration and continuous delivery process that helps us avoid any of these challenges. So we're going to walk through, you know, how we actually went through this modernization exercise. And, you know, when we when we want to go through and we want to, um, you know, refresh, you know, the UI, as I mentioned, this can be a little bit cumbersome. Um, you know, anytime we make these changes. If we have to do this manually, we can make we can make uh, mistakes, and you know maybe we don't have the correct image here, and that can certainly be a problem. And you know rolling out these these updates, not only is it making the changes as you know the, our development team, but then pushing out these updates to the website, it does take time. And as as I said, you know we were historically using FTP to make this happen, and it was you know really difficult. The other aspect here is, you know, for our pet clinic is that we don't have a huge budget and, you know, we, we, we don't want to pay, you know, a lot of money uh, to make this happen. So we want to rely on open source and, you know, there are a few open source technologies that can help us do this today. And then finally, you know, we've been reading a lot about, you know, how companies are doing this at scale and, you know, hyperscale companies such as Netflix or, or Snap you know, they, they've been using some new technologies to make this happen. And so we want to look at, you know, what's the way that they're doing this? Because as our business continues to scale up, we want to be able to stay current with the times. And as I mentioned, you know, the whole theme here is, is that, you know, pushing changes to our web application, it just takes a tremendous amount of time. It's prone to issues and we want to come, come we want to figure out a new option here. And so again, this is Tilly. This is the new pet clinic uh, rescue. Uh, she's a wonderful dog, and we really want to highlight her on our uh, on our new web application. So with that, let's dive a little bit deeper into actually modernizing the pet clinic application. 
So first thing, what I want to do is I want to talk about Amazon EKS. And Amazon EKS is our fully managed uh, Kubernetes service. And you know, AWS provides this fully managed uh, Kubernetes service. And what's really great about it is, is that we are managing the control plane on the user's behalf. So the control plane runs on, you know, on within AWS resources, but the actual workloads, like your applications run within your account on EC2 instances that are in your account that you fully manage. So we take on the heavy lifting of making sure that the API server fully scales, that etcd, the database component fully scales. And then, um, and then in terms of the overall upgrades, we also have, you know, a managed node group feature, which if you need to do full lifecycle management, let's say you need to patch your instances, um, you know, we can handle that. So if you have, you know, security policy that's required where you need to push out, you know, new AMI every, you know, 30 or 60 days, a new machine image every 30 and 60 days, you can totally do this with our managed node group feature. And it really takes on that heavy lifting. So you don't have to worry about manually upgrading your Kubernetes workers. So it's, it's highly scalable, very flexible. And um, it, this is what you know, we're, we're, we're choosing to use for our pet clinic application today. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, my friend Urshad here, and he's going to walk you through um, the, some of the open source tools that we've selected here today. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. So um, I, I just wanted to spend some uh, a few seconds on talking about some of the components that Paul touched upon we will be using in this presentation. Um, from the continuous integration, um, a software delivery perspective, there are two things uh, that come to our mind. One is for continuous software integration. Uh, Jenkins is very popular, it's open source. It's got a great um, developer community um, backing and then lots of plugins in order to integrate Jenkins with a lot of uh, other services. So, Jenkins works very well, and it's easy to, uh, you know, deploy Jenkins on top of um, Amazon uh, EC2, which is the Elastic Computer Cloud Service, which I'm going to show you in the demo, which is what we have done for the demo as well. Now, what Jenkins does with the help of the concept of pipelines, you can code, we can codify the pipelines and make it very easy uh, for the developers to focus on writing code and then even codifying those pipelines, which will make uh, it possible for uh, us to deliver software at scale. Um, then the, on the other side, the right side, you will see uh, Spinnaker. So Spinnaker is, um, you know, it integrates very well via Jenkins. And uh, it's responsible for doing continuous software delivery, meaning when Jenkins builds the code and then deploys those container images into container registries, and then we can have Spinnaker integrate via Jenkins and then deploy uh, or deliver uh, software in the form of container images into Amazon EKS. So we have an end-to-end -end automated testing, building and packaging uh, in order to enable us as software uh, developers to uh, continuously deliver software as Cal. Um, one of our partners, Armory, I just wanted to uh, few, spend some few minutes here. Um, recently, they've done an awesome job of uh, rolling out this new service called Continuous Deployment as a Service. Uh, it's a SaaS service that runs on top of uh, AWS. And what we see is it gives you a, a easy to use user experience for um, deploying your software at scale. So if you look at the architecture, um, you know, Armory uh, continuous delivery, uh, continuous deployment as a service is in the middle. And then uh, on the other side, we have the, um, the Kubernetes clusters. So that's the, uh, the environments, the Amazon EKS, uh, for instance, where we want to deploy and, and deliver software at scale. So Armory CD as a service um, uses gRPC HTTP to a protocol to uh, register Amazon EKS. So there's a concept called remote network agent 
when you register Amazon EKS clusters via this service, uh, it's actually going to deploy an agent which is responsible for maintaining the uh, bi-directional communication between our very CD as a service and Amazon EKS. And on the left side, we have the developers writing code. Let's say, you know, we use GitHub um, and then source control and GitHub has a touch point using to REST API uh, to uh, communicate with CDS service. We have integration touch points with Jenkins, GitLab, as well as even Spinnaker. Um, and Armory, what they have done uh, as well, you know, they are um, helping developers use what is called as Armory CDS service CLI, which will enable uh, developers to use CLI in order to deliver software uh, at scale using Armory CD as a service. So now the advantage of using this service from Armory is we don't have to really, you know, configure Spinnaker. You know, this will be done, that all of that plumbing will be done at enterprise grade by this service. All right, so let's talk about infrastructure as code. Uh, one, one of the uh, uh, tools that we are using as part of this presentation is uh, Terraform Cloud. HashiCorp um, has uh, this offering, which is uh, a fully managed uh, platform in, in the cloud. So for developers who have used open source uh, Terraform in, in uh, uh, deploying and um, in, uh, provisioning infrastructure. This is a good offering. Now, it brings a lot of uh, different advantages to us as, as, as builders and developers. Um, for example, there's a concept of organizations and workspaces where it becomes very easy for us to manage different environments when we deploy them uh, on AWS. So we may have uh, a pre-production environment or a, a production environment, it becomes very easy for us using workspaces to manage those different environments from Terraform Cloud. Uh, the other thing which is very important is the state management. Now, Terraform manages or provisions infrastructure and it maintains what is called as the um, a state of the infrastructure. This is like a file. Now, if you use open source Terraform, you as a developer, you will have to maintain and, and then uh, the, the storage of that, uh, this infra infrastructure state, right? And it becomes very difficult for uh, you to scale because let's say you're a team of developers and you're running open source Terraform on your laptop. Uh, your other developers have no way visibility, no way of getting and then using that state. So what Terraform Cloud does, it maintains the Terraform state in the cloud. So for developers in a team, it becomes very easy to work on the same projects. Also, it gives us a rich user interface. Um, it's a easier, uh, easy to use interface uh, for provisioning infrastructure and working in a team. And you will also get access to module registry where we have built-in modules, uh, you know, that community has developed or you as a team have developed and you can share the, those modules uh, with teams across the enterprise. Uh, it also gives us the capability of leveraging GitOps best practices as a team, right, which uh, we'll see in the demo. And Terraform Cloud has a capability which is called uh, policy as code. So, um, you know, governance is a big issue. It's, it's a big thing, big focus for all of us. Sentinel is a tool which enables teams to uh, enforce policies, whether it's, for example, you know, maintaining the cost down or a tagging, you know, maintaining a uniformity in tagging resources so that it becomes very easy for teams to um, track the different types of resources when they get provisioned in, inside AWS. So the workflow for the uh, Terraform Cloud is um, you have the private module registry which are created by the developers on the, on the left. 
And then we as a, a builder or, or, or a developer, we write infrastructure as code. So that remains the same, right? We, we write hash XCL files to, to provision infrastructure. This could be Amazon EKS or uh, you know different types of uh, compute services or any services. And then in the middle, we have the uh, using uh, API calls, we use Terraform Cloud. Terraform Cloud maintains the state file, like I said, right? And what Terraform Cloud does, it uh, uses the different providers, Terraform providers for operations with, for example, AWS. And on the right side, you will see on the screen, you know, those resources getting provisioned in uh, AWS. So uh, let's um, focus on uh, the architecture, one possible architecture for delivering software at scale um, that you see here is, you know, for this demo that we have prepared, we have uh, three different types of uh, Amazon EKS clusters, just to give you the visualization of if you're doing it in, in, in production or pre-production. So we have two different clusters, UAT cluster, this could be your pre-production uh, Amazon EKS cluster. And then we have a production EKS cluster running a specific region. And you have the choice of distributing this in different regions uh, in the global infrastructure that uh, we had to offer. And I have another uh, Amazon EKS cluster where I have provision Spinnaker, uh, let's say open source Spinnaker, right? And then on the left, you know, um, we uh, use um, a, uh, a AWS Cloud9, which is like a um, a, a console service in, or, or you know, a, a, it's an interface that you use um, uh, in in AWS. Uh, it runs on top of EC2. So a developer using an AWS Cloud9 uh, will have source code in GitHub, for example. That's the version control, right? And then um, writing code, writing features, and then pushing those uh, changes, source code changes into GitHub source control. And what uh, that does is that triggers Jenkins. Jenkins, which I talked earlier from the continuous integration perspective. Now, how do we provision Jenkins and Amazon EKS clusters? We use Terraform Cloud to do that. That's where you see Terraform Cloud as part of this our architecture. Now when Jenkins uh, gets triggered, so we have jobs or projects configured in Jenkins using um, pipelines. Uh, so it will build the code, it will test the code depending on the different stages that we have in the pipeline. And then ultimately it will push software in the form of a container image into container registry like Docker Hub in this case, for example, or we could use Amazon ECR. And then when the image gets pushed into Docker Hub, that will trigger the Spinnaker pipeline as part of the continuous delivery uh, life cycle. So what that will do is that the, those pipelines will deploy software into UAT cluster. And then once the software gets uh, deployed into UAT cluster, there is an end user sitting and testing that software. If all goes well, um, it looks good, the changes look good um, based on what the intent was. Then there's a manual approval that you see, maybe an administrator sitting on top of the Spinnaker uh, pipeline. And then if all goes well, the testing goes well, then that approval gets approved and then ultimately that software gets deployed using Spinnaker to production uh, cluster. So that's like an end-to-end architecture of uh, enabling you as builders and developers to deploy software at scale in AWS using a number of the tools that we uh, earlier talked about. All right, at this point, uh, what I would like to do is go and uh, show you a demo um, uh, that, that will give you an end-to-end uh, visual into how this works at scale. All right, here I am logged into uh, my Jenkins uh, user interface and I have a job which is already pre-configured 
uh, to run a pipeline. And on the left, you'll see the build history. And on the right side, you will see the different stages of this pipeline. And if I go into the um, the Jenkins pipeline, which I codified, you'll see the uh, the code here. This pipeline comprise of, comprises of a number of stages, staging, start, starting from build application, and then we have test application, and then we have build Docker image um, as the third stage, and then we have a, a push Docker image, and finally at the bottom you will see remove local images just to free up uh, the space from those um, Docker images. Now, all of these stages will have steps which we have codified. So for a developer, it's one time one time tasks to write the code for the Jenkins pipeline. And then, you know, going back into the Jenkins dashboard, you will see these individual stages laid out for you in the stage view. And these are some of the, uh, the previous executions that um, uh, I have uh, executed. And when I log into my Spinnaker, uh, console, I, I see here three pipelines, Spinnaker pipelines, as you can see, deploy to UAT, deploy to prod, and then manual approval. The user interface lets you to configure these individual uh, pipelines. So I have to deploy to UAT. This gets triggered um, directly from the Docker hub. So when Jenkins drops the Docker image into the Docker hub, this pipeline gets executed or gets triggered. And then you can set up the artifact. So I have the Kubernetes YAML file, which has the description of the services and the deployments. Similarly, I have the deploy to prod uh, Spinnaker pipeline, which looks very similar, except that it deploys, it gets triggered um, from a manual approval pipeline, which I will talk about next. And it deploys to a production Amazon EKS cluster. Now, you can customize these Spinnaker pipelines um, depending on the requirements that we have for every individual environment. So pre-production UAT may be different than uh, production environment. And once we do that, then we can um, connect these pipelines. So we have the manual approval pipeline, which is like an approval process. Um, this gets um, actually triggered by uh, the deploy to UAT pipeline. And here we're asking for a yes or a no, or an approval or a reject, uh, sort of a, kind of an approval process that if, if UAT gets deployed, okay, should we go ahead and then deploy to a production environment? So this is a good way of connecting different pipelines in a chain. And then if we come to the load balancers, you will see here, UAT, you know, I have an ingress endpoint, which is the load balancer endpoint. Similarly, for in a production uh, environment, I have a load balancer as well. And these are the endpoints of the application. Here, we have the application running in UAT through that load balancer. And similarly, in the other tab, this one, this is running in production. So I have two different instances of the application running, just to give you an illustration of how you can have the you know, going code changes going from one environment to the other environment. So let's go and, and then speak from a developer endpoint perspective. So I have a Cloud9 instance that I talked earlier, and I have the a file called welcome.html open. All I'm doing is I'm updating the image on that uh, that front page, the welcome HTML. So after modifying the image, I save the changes. And as a developer, what I will do is I will commit these changes using the CLI I'm, use, I'm used to using um, as a developer. So um, I get to know that the welcome.html file has changed. And as part of the Git workflow, 
um, you know, I will be now pushing these changes into the source control. Now you will see when these changes get pushed to the source control, all of these changes are documented as part of the that workflow process, right? Um, and immediately after I store or I up, update the or, or commit these changes into the source control, what will happen is you will see that um, this will trigger the Jenkins job. So here I have 14 uh, runs that I've done uh, as part of the build history on Jenkins uh, dashboard. And within a matter of few seconds, you'll see a job gets triggered. This is because Jenkins has picked up the change from the source control uh, when I push the change. So that triggers the whole pipeline and the individual stages that you have. You have access to the logs from Jenkins as well into the individual stages. So we have checkout, build the application, which will build source code, which will um, you know, the, this is using Enterprise Java, um, and I'm using Maven to, to do for the project uh, management. And uh, an Enterprise R gets uh, built and deployed and packaged. And um, I have a test stage as well, the, where you could actually write some test scripts. Um, and then after the test pass, then you will see that um, you know, there's a stage to build the Docker image and followed by pushing that into Docker Hub, which I showed earlier in the architecture. And finally, we remove, yes, to say the space from Jenkins instance to the local images. Now, if I go back into the Spinnaker UA uh, user interface, you will see here are the three uh, pipelines. Now, in a, in a matter of few seconds, you will see that deploy to UAT uh, Spinnaker pipeline will get triggered. Now this gets triggered when a new um, tag of the Docker image gets pushed into the Docker registry. And that's intentional, obviously, because the code has changed. There's a new container image in the uh, container registry and that gets picked by deploy to UAT pipeline. So you'll see this pipeline getting executed with it has got two stages uh, that you see here. And then after this gets executed, uh, then you know it gets dropped into the manual approval process, which obviously gives me two options, uh, approve or reject. So let's hold on to the manual approval yet because it keeps on waiting for the manual intervention. And meanwhile, what we will do now is go back and log into the UAT application. This is the endpoint for the UAT. And what I will be doing is I'll be refreshing the page and let's see what happens. We get the code change that we did. We get that reflected in the application. So this is continuous integration and continuous delivery in, in, in product. Now, if I go back into production, I don't see any changes yet because I have not committed, pushed, uh, those changes, it's still waiting for the manual approval here. So because it's waiting, now I go and then probably approve this, all looks good. And then this will trigger the deploy to prod Spinnaker pipeline. What this will do is this will deploy the code changes into production Amazon EKS cluster once it runs all of these stages. So you will see the indication from the user interface, very friendly interface that Spinnaker offers, right? So, um, and then you will see, um, like I said earlier, you have two ingress endpoints, uh, one for each environment. Now, if I go back to the, the production instance of the application now, because we don't have the changes yet, and then do a refresh, and now you will see that that core change that we did has propagated now into production environment as well. So this is how we chain uh, end-to-end delivery of software. And this is how we deliver software um, at scale uh, using continuous integration, continuous delivery, using the tools and services and that we talked earlier um, as part of the architecture diagram. 
So I hope that um, helps and um, it makes a sense. And then um, as part of the demo, um, you know, all of this is end to end and it has built in automation for the infrastructure using Terraform Cloud and uh, automation from the continuous integration using Jenkins uh, pipelines and also from the continuous delivery perspective using Spinnaker pipelines. All right, thanks for watching the demo and the presentation. At this point, both Paul and I were ready to take your questions. Uh, here are our contact details. These are our email addresses and our Twitter handles. If you want to co connect with us, feel free to drop an email and then uh, we'll get in touch with you. Thank you.